everyone, and thank you for participating in the 2024 DBE online video training series. This is actually the first training video we're doing, and it's going to be on government contracting and some of the basics about getting into it um, and how to get off on the right foot and some tips to be successful at government contracting in general. Today, me and Trish will be the ones presenting this information. And with that being said, let's jump right into it. So the learning objectives we're going to go over today is the bidding process, some terminology, and the different types of estimates. Then we're going to look at crafting a detailed estimate, and then we're going to look at strategic bidding. So let's begin with why do I actually need a good bidding process? So according to the US Department of Commerce, construction and contracting businesses have the highest failure rate of any other business. Up to 96% of construction and contracting companies fail before reaching 10 years in business. Now, most companies fail to win government contracts because of inaccuracies in their estimating and bidding process, and that's why this topic is so important. The last note I want to mention here is according to the American Association of Cost Engineers, construction firms constitute about 8% of all businesses in the United States. However, they represent 17% of all business failures. So about one in five of every companies that fail in the United States are a construction related business. Again, that's why it's so important to have this bidding and estimating process defined. So let's take a look at some of the common terminology used in government contracting. These three terms, quote, estimate and bid, you're going to hear a lot and they're used interchangeably, but it's important to identify what we're actually talking about and how it relates to government contracting. So a quote is a concise figure that a contractor receives or supplies outlining the price of materials and services needed for a job. And it's often valid for a specific time frame, and that's because material prices fluctuate depending on supply and demand. So usually a quote is valid for 30 days. An estimate, what we typically associate an estimate with is when we have a contractor come out to our house and give us an estimate on how much it's going to cost to do our floors, to do our doors, our windows. In government contracting, an estimate is something a little bit different. This is actually an internal document to the company, a detailed summation of the expected costs, materials, labor, equipment, overhead, and profit to execute a project. So while an estimate does lay out the overhead, the profit, and overall markups, that's not what you're going to share necessarily with the government or with the prime contractor. This is more internal so that you can outline your specific costs. And the last document is a bid. And this is the formal document that offers to perform a specific job at a specific price within a certain amount of time. The markups are going to be built into the final cost into this bid, but they're not specifically outlined on the bid. So if you're a subcontractor, you're typically going to be submitting a quote to a prime contractor. That subcontractor, however, is going to craft an estimate for their own quote and their own company. And then if you're a prime contractor or you're, you're soliciting directly to the government or owning agency, you're going to submit a bid. So depending on what you're being asked for and what landscape you're operating in, these words mean different things. So it's important to know what you're being asked for and what's being expected. So let's look at a few different types of estimates. Order of magnitude. This is going to be ballpark figures, mostly used to evaluate a project's desirability, and they're quick to produce, but they lack accuracy. So essentially, this is what you're going to look at to say, do we even want to put in the time to do a formal estimate and to put together a proposal or a quote, um, you know, depending on mostly the, the experience of the estimator. And depending on that ex estimator's experience, the magnitude estimates can usually be accurate somewhere between negative 35% to 50%. So again, this is real ballpark figures just to kind of get your headspace in the right mentality to determine if you even want to go to the next step. A parametric estimate, this is going to be based upon the size and scope parameters of a project, more of a statistics-based estimate. This is going to approximate estimates for the different work types that are involved in a project. And it's really useful for highly repetitive type projects. So things that you know what the cost and time intensity is for each item that's in the work type, this is where you do more of a parametric statistics based approach. And finally, the detailed or definitive estimate, this is going to be the most specialized one. So this forms the backbone for cost control, negotiations, and the final bid itself, and it quantifies all project elements and prices each accordingly. 
So depending on the size of the project, detailed estimates can be highly specialized. They take a great deal of time to complete um, compared to these other projects, but they're also the most accurate. And this is going to be the most common type used in government contracting because since the margins are so tight, you really need to know what every single cost item is going to be so that you can put together the most competitive bid. And that's what we're going to look at, how to actually craft that detailed or definitive estimate. And these are the 10 steps that we're going to take a look at. So we're going to talk about reviewing the contract documents, performing a pre-bid site visit, attending the pre-bid meeting if available, estimating the general conditions, performing a quantity takeoff, determining prices for each element, estimating the labor, estimating the equipment, determining the overhead, and determining the markup. Great, so when we're looking at crafting a detailed estimate, you really want to review the contract documents. The project manual or the spec book, um, you want to see how the prescribed work is to be performed. It's going to tell you how the quality and acceptability of the work will be determined, any allowable tolerances, how the payments will be made, and how changed conditions are to be handled. You want to make sure that you're reading all of it, this, especially when you're working with a new agency. Um, you need to know the required contract provisions, if there's any bonding required, um, any local wildlife or archaeological information that you need, um, or any cleanup measures. You also want to make sure that you are reading project plans, sheets, or drawings. Those are going to be helpful for determining the likely sequence of operations and how you can expect that to time out. And then it contains any estimates of quantities. Remember that when you're looking at these contract documents that you are contractually liable for all requirements included in that complete document. So you want to make sure you thoroughly understand that. Then you want to make sure that you perform a pre-bid site visit. You want to look get a look of the land. You want to make sure you know um, actual distance to the travel site, any soil conditions you need to be aware of, water and power sources that are available. Do you have cell phone service? Do your workers have cell phone service out there? Um, if there's any protected wetlands, um, waste disposal considerations that you need to have, equipment and materials sources, security, traffic control. Um, Google Maps is a good measuring tool, and so you can use that as well, but really an on-hand site visit is recommended. The next thing you want to do is make sure that you attend the pre-bid meeting. This is your chance to ask direct questions to the contracting officer. Pre-bid meetings are gatherings scheduled after the invitation for bids or request for proposals are advertised. And the objective of the pre-bid meeting is to explain the details of the solicitation documents to interested bidders. That's going to include the timelines, any requirements, the scope of work, any specific job details. And you should attend this even if you don't have any questions because it could give you some insights that, that aren't in the documents. And again, this is the only time that a prospective bidder is permitted to request clarifications on the invitation for bids or the request for proposals directly. So next you want to estimate the general conditions. General conditions refer to the items and costs that are directly related to the completion of the project, but that are not considered part of the completion of specific work tasks. So these are indirect costs that are related to the project, like surveying, any temporary construction offices or temporary restrooms that are needed, storage structures, do you need some on-site telephones, um, any utility bills that you'd have out there, um, do you need security like fences, lighting, personnel um, for security, signage, um, fuel for your vehicles, for your equipment, a superintendent or any other supervisory personnel, dust control, noise control, all of those things. This is a way to further refine your estimate once you have these, these conditions, and these are just the direct and indirect costs. So the general conditions pertain to on-site costs and shouldn't be confused with general overhead costs. So that does not include the overhead costs that are not associated with the project. The lack of attention to these details 
can reduce or possibly eliminate your profit margin when you really start to comply with what you need to contractually. So next we're going to perform a quantity takeoff. So the quantity takeoff is essentially where estimators are going to determine the total number of individual work items to be completed, the total amount of construction materials needed, um, and what all of those are going to cost. So some examples here are cubic yards of concrete needed to construct a certain box culvert tons of number four epoxy coated rebar, or even the square footage of erosion control blankets. Usually quantity takes off, takeoffs usually take more time than any other task um, because it's so important to really understand what all of these individual details entail and what those costs are going to be. So you want to keep costs separate and price out each element individually. So a few notes here is different measurements. Pay attention. When you're looking at the estimate of quantities in the plan sheets, make sure you're doing the right measurement calculations. Is it square feet, square yard, pounds, tons? If you're working at, working with a lot of different types of projects or different types of items, they may change the metric they're using to measure. So just again, really pay attention to what you're calculating. Different cost levels occur depending on operations and different crews or equipment may be needed. So really what you're trying to do here is figure out through the plans and through the estimate of quantities, what is this project going to look like? You want to try to take a step back and look at the 30,000 foot approach and say, OK, this is the likely sequence of events that's going to happen based on my experience with the industry and similar projects. And this is what I think it's going to take. Usually the engineer's estimates are pretty accurate, but don't forget that you are the actual expert. So if it comes to something more specialized or the work that your company does, don't necessarily rely wholeheartedly on the estimates that the, the plans say. Really do your own due diligence, your own research, and try to conceptualize how is this going to work, what am I going to need to do, and how much is that going to cost. So a few more tips on conducting a quantity takeoff. If the quantities are wrong, the entire estimate will be wrong. Um, so one of the big things to do is make sure you have a practical and um, standardized process for guessing different types of, of metrics. So if you're looking at a distance and you say, OK, that's going to be about two to three feet of whatever the material is. Well, then when you're looking at another page of the plan, you're like, oh, OK, that could be about three to six feet. And then you have somebody else looking at your estimate and they say that's between two and a half to seven and a half feet. Well, all of these kind of guesstimations all add up at the final product. And then what you get at the end instead of an accurate estimate is really just a broad range of potential X to X numbers. So you want to use um, metrics. So if you're going to use two to three feet, use 2.25 or 2.5 or 2.75 and stick to that. That way you're standardizing your approach. Don't be afraid to mark up the plan set. Um, sometimes people print them out and they don't want to mess with them because they're they're all nice and professional and it's a lot of paper or it's expensive to print out, mark them up. Use different colors, use different highlighters, do what you need to do to be able to have the information pop out of the plans because there's a lot of information in there and you're only interested in what applies to you. Again, follow the logical order and complete the big picture items first. You're trying to figure out a story here from the beginning to end. What is this project going to look like and where is my piece in there? Am I going to just come in, do my part and leave? Am I going to be called back in? What happens if something goes wrong and what I did at the beginning gets destroyed or gets messed up or um, needs to be maintained? Do I have to come back in? And if so, am I budgeting for that? So you really want to look at the whole story and not just look, get so you know tunnel vision into the specific work and look at the whole project as a, as a big picture. Estimate each drawing in a consistent manner. Again, use those decimal equivalents to standardize your calculations. And then visualize the method in which the work will progress. So the more that you can understand that, the more accurate your detailed estimate will be. And if you don't have the experience, that's where it helps to rely on people who do or or play it safer in your estimate so that you don't go into the red. So the next thing we're going to do is determine prices for each of those elements. So material pricing needs to be fair and consistent. So compare your costs with current vendors and industry standards. You don't want to mark up the cost of your supplies and materials to make more of a profit because in government contracting, the, the projects are already razor tight margins that if you try to extort any part of that, um, your bid's going to be very non-competitive. 
Sources of material cost information. So when you're trying to figure out the prices, utilize company records if you can. Any experience or any metrics that you have with your actual company, past performance, past estimates, that is the most valuable piece of information. So the more experience you have, the more you can draw from real data. And that's that proprietary information that companies keep close to their chest because that's going to be able to determine, hey, this is how much my materials cost. Here's how much my how much time my team needs to get this done. That's really where all the wiggle room is when you're crafting an estimate. So keep track of that data as you're working on projects and then refer back to it as you're doing estimates. So some other considerations when we're looking at prices is regional differences in availability. You may be able to purchase supplies where you live, but if your project takes you out to a different county, even a different state, what does that look like out there? What's the supply and demand out there? So you just want to kind of factor that in. Uh, the geographical location of the project is really important when it comes to pricing. And speaking of geography, transportation and storage cost. How long is it going to take you to get out there? What are the roads looking like? Are all the roads open or are the roads under construction? Is there a detour that's going to make you have to go around someplace that's going to add more time to your drive? And if you do deliver materials, what about storage costs? Can you just drop it off at the project site and leave? Or are you responsible for maintaining that in a storage facility? And what does that look like in that area? FOB, freight on board. Um, Basically, if the term reads FOB, it means that transportation costs to the job site are going to be included into the cost of materials. So if you're doing a, um, a supply and furnish and install or supplier type function, um, you want to keep an eye on if those FOB parameters are in place. And then quantity discounts. So many vendors will provide discounts for large orders, which will enable you to lower your estimate. So the more you establish those vendor relationships and keep returning to them, the more likely you are to get better prices and the more likely you are to charge less in your bid and be more competitive. And lastly, sales tax. So again, depending on where your project is operating, where you're buying the materials, where you're transporting the materials, um, where you're selling the materials, always be aware of how sales tax affects your bid as well. So now we're going to look at calculating labor. A first look, if you don't love math or you don't like equations, this may be very off-putting to you, but I promise this is a pretty simple calculation to actually determine labor. So labor productivity, which is the first thing we're trying to find here, productivity rate, is the rate at which crews can produce work. So that's the first formula. The first thing we need to find is the productivity rate. Once we have the productivity rate, we can plug that in to find our labor cost. So to find productivity rate, we're going to take the numbers of workers in a crew. We're going to multiply it by the number of work hours in a workday. And we're going to divide that by the number of units that crews can install per workday. So that bottom number there, the number of units crew can install per workday, that's going to come from company data saying this is if we're installing silt fence, this is how much we can typically do in a day. Then once we have that, we're going to take we're going to go down to the labor cost formula. So we're going to take that productivity rate. We're going to multiply that by the number of units we need to install and then divide that by the hourly pay rate for the entire crew, and that will give us our labor cost. So let's look at an example to kind of spell that out a little bit more. The objective here is to install 1000 feet of silt fence. We have a crew of three and the workday is eight hours. So our first step is to find that productivity rate. So we're going to take those three workers multiply it by eight hours in a workday. You're not going to do 24 hours, even though each worker is working eight hours a day. It's just the one workday. And then we know from our previous company data that we can install around 200 feet of silt fence per day. So when you take the 24, divide that by the 200, you get 0.12. That's our productivity rate. Now, that number in itself may not mean a whole lot, but if you multiply that by 60, as in 60 minutes per hour, and that tells you 7.2 minutes per foot of silt fence. That tells you how long it takes. Now, the really great thing about this productivity rate is that baked into that number is all of the human elements. So that's lunches, that's breaks, that's standing by waiting for work to get done. Because that 200 feet that can be installed in a workday is encompassing all of that human element as well. So this 7.2 minutes per foot of silt fence is actually an incredibly accurate number for what your company can do in a workday. 
you know, it's unreasonable to expect that your crew is going to be out there eight hours nonstop working. They're going to take breaks. They're going to have water breaks. They're going to have lunch. So this number really puts a realistic spin on how do you calculate labor. But now that we have the productivity rate, of 0.12, now we got to do that second formula to figure out what is our actual labor cost? What are we going to put in to our quote or into our bid? So we're going to take that productivity rate, 0.12. We know that we have to install 1,000 units of silt fence, or in this case, it's going to be 1,000 feet. And then we pay, let's say we pay our crew $22 an hour for three people. So the total pay rate for the entire crew is going to be $66. So we multiply all that together and we get $7,920 for the installation of 1,000 feet of silt fence. So that gives us our number for what it should cost, but it also can tell us in a different way how much time that's going to take. And like I said, this number is very accurate. So that's seven th that $8,000 roughly is also incorporating lunches, time off, breaks, things of that nature. So now that we have the labor rate, we need to estimate equipment. So what kind of equipment do we need on the job? And there's four primary considerations to look at. The type, the production rate, which is determining how many hours of operation is needed, and what does that cost? And again, referring to internal records if available. The cost of operating equipment on the job site. So looking at owning versus renting, insurance costs that come out of that, fuel and maintenance that goes into that as well. And specifically with renting, something to consider is that what is the availability of renting equipment? Um, a lot of times, especially in more rural areas, all the companies that rent heavy equipment they're booked for the whole season almost instantly. So if that's your plan is to rent equipment, you need to either do it in advance um, or you need to be prepared for an alternative that maybe that equipment's not going to be available. What are you going to do then? A lot of people shy away from purchasing equipment because it's a larger upfront cost, but down the line it saves in terms of scheduling, trying to have a, a rental fee every season. Um, there's a lot of benefits to buying upfront if you can manage the capital to do so. And then cost of mobilization. So one thing people often overlook is the time it takes to mobilize. So other than just the distance, think about the time to attach and detach equipment from a trailer. Anything that takes your crew time should be considered into your, your estimate. Now, whether or not you put a dollar amount to that or you charge that to your actual final bid, that's going to depend on a lot of different factors, but you should at least be aware of that and know how much time that takes and essentially how much that costs. OK, so now we have our labor rate. We know our equipment. So now we're determining the overhead rate. So at its core, overhead rate are your indirect costs divided by your direct costs. So we talked earlier about general conditions, which are indirect costs that are still tied to a project. But in this overhead rate, that's going to be your indirect costs are going to be your general conditions, but it's also going to be all your other costs. So your home office costs, utilities, salaries that are going to be paid to office personnel such as office administrators maybe estimators hr finance depending on you know what your your business looks like that's going to be all your indirect costs so overhead costs do not appear on estimates um, but rather they're included as part of the overall markup so this is really where you have more flexibility in your estimate and and your bidding power is determining how much are you spending in overhead as well. One thing to consider is that overhead rates do not go up on a one for one basis. So if you hire a new person, you don't 100% increase your overhead rate. You have to actually look at, well, what does the overhead rate, how does that change if we hire a new person? Do we have to, hire, do we have to pay for a new building? No. Do our utilities costs change? Most likely not. So you wouldn't necessarily increase your overhead rate on a one for one basis as you grow your business. If you do, what will end up happening is your overhead is going to be so high that your bids are going to be completely non-competitive and you're going to be way overbidding. And if you don't understand why, that's really a good place to look. Let's start by looking at our overhead and see how are we allocating these costs. So to break it down a little bit more, a direct cost, these, this is going to be equipment. So the production rate, operating mobilization costs to actually get your equipment to the job site and to use it, that's a direct cost. Labor, that's going to be your payroll and fringe benefits. 
The thing about labor is that you want to use the fully burdened rate, which means not just what you pay your team, but all of the other intangible benefits that go as well. So time off um, if they have a 401k, everything like that bleeds into your fully burdened rate. And then materials. So what materials are actually be, actually being used for the project? So essentially, if there is no project, there are no direct costs. If there is a cost that happens when there is no project, it's most likely not a direct cost. It's going to be an indirect cost, such as the rent, the utilities, travel, taxes, insurance. Those are things that are the cost of running a business, not necessarily completing that specific project. So now determine the markup. So a few things to consider is that what's the anticipation anticipated competition for the job? If it's a highly competitive job, that means you're not going to probably be able to have as much of a markup as you would if there was a very specialized, only a handful of people applying for it. Um, if there's a lot of competition, then it's going to be even tighter margin. So you want to know what is the actual landscape look like? What's the playing field look like? Company workload at the time of job performance. So if you have a lot of work, if you have a lot of revenue stream coming in and you have a lot of projects going on, maybe you don't need as much of a markup. Maybe this project is able to float you until you get more um, payments from your prime so that you can pay your vendors, or maybe you want this project for um, the experience so you don't really need to have much of a markup, or maybe it's exactly the opposite. Maybe you need more money coming in from them. So looking at the company workload, what the future projects look like, and, and all the current um, climate of what your, your operations are, that helps determine what you want to put for a markup. Current marketplace and industry trends. So you always want to be aligned with the industry. If your markups are completely out of range of what the standard companies are doing, then that tells you that you need to reevaluate. Um, as a DBE company, you are still operating. You still want to match what the non-DBE companies are doing. So again, know the, know the marketplace, know the industry. Um, usually 7 to 20% is a normal markup for construction companies. But if you're going in a highly competitive government contracting arena, you may have to be on the lower end of that, depending on the project. So familiarity with the duties and operations to be performed. This is a big one. If this is something that you feel very confident in, you understand the project, you have the experience, you can send your crew out there, you know they're going to get it done efficiently and quickly, then you may not need to get as much of a markup. You may not need to put so much stock in, in profit on this because you know it's going to go smoothly and then that's going to free you up to do something else. Um, so familiarity with the duties and operations to be performed is definitely one of those intangible considerations to, to put into effect. And then the strategic desire for the company to grow or diversify. We're going to talk about strategic bidding here in a little bit, but this is another thing that you're considering. What's the point of taking this project? Is it to make a profit or is it to work in a new function or work for a specific prime or try to work on a project that's going to kind of expand your past performance repertoire? So depending on what your, your goal is for the project, that's going to help determine this markup as well. So now we want to finalize the estimate. So to finalize the estimate, you're simply going to add up all the separate costs that you've calculated, such as your, your materials, your labor, your equipment, and then you're going to multiply that by your markup, which consists of your overhead, your risk, your profit, and bonding. And that's going to be the final estimate. So a couple of things, going back to that estimate of quantities and doing that quantity takeoff, that's where your costs come from. So when you're talking about your final estimate, it's two things. It's your costs and it's your markup. So the more specific and more refined you can get the materials, that labor costs, that equipment usage, that travel, the mobilization, the more accurate you can get to your final estimate. Now, your markup is going to be where things get a little bit different because this is where you actually have more flexibility in your overhead, in your risk, in your profit and bonding. So if you need to be bonded, what's the cost that goes along with that? Um, and the thing about risk is it's very based on what are you potentially going to have to do. So if you're, am I going to have to go back and fix my work? Am I going to have to go back and maintain things I've done? Um, what are the odds that the project gets delayed? And now I have to have my crew on site for an extra week. So I have to pay lodging and um, that puts me behind schedule on my other projects. That is all something that's really hard to define, especially hard to put a number on, but it needs to be considered and needs to be built in so that way you can cover yourself. But in a balance that you're not going to put so much money into risk 
increase your markup so much that your final estimate isn't competitive. It's always a balancing game. And at the very end of the day, if you're confident in your number and you say, this is my no kidding bottom line, I do not want to go below this number or I'm going to go into the red, then that's that's a number you can be confident in and submit. And if you don't win, you don't have to feel bad about not winning because you know you weren't going to go lower than that. So that's essentially what we're trying to do with a detailed estimate is find that number that we can be sure of that this is the number I will not go lower than. So before we move on to the next section, let's just look at some final estimating tips on crafting that detailed estimate. Number one, good record keeping equals more accurate estimates. So I've said it before, having that past performance data to pull from, having accurate job costing principles in place so that your team is tracking time and cost on every part of the project, that's all the information that you're going to pull from for future estimates. So definitely keep track of your records and know how to use that data efficiently. And these are some of the things to record when you're actually working on a project. So actual hours spent on each task, the labor rates for those tasks, the actual unit cost of materials and transportation, materials purchases versus materials used, and that's to measure waste, equipment production and operational rates, so your fuel, your insurance, what does it actually cost? When that slide, when we were looking at estimating the equipment and we said pulling the equipment production from previous data, this is how you do it. You gather that on a current project. Same with equipment maintenance costs and schedules. Actual downtime for different types of equipment. How much time is your equipment just sitting on a job site not doing anything? More importantly, how much money is that pulling away from another project? And then your profit or loss resulting from the project. Your final estimate, this is what we put in, we want it. This is how much it actually costs. That is one of the strongest things you can have when you're doing your next estimate. OK, now looking at strategic bidding. So strategic bidding is basing the bid slash no bid decision on a previously defined business objective. So your business plan or company goals, your prospective new client with future opportunities. Are you looking at expanding or on your expertise or a new division? Or are you looking at expanding geographically? So it might not just be profit that you're looking at. It's not the deciding factor. And so then the usual markup formula may not apply. Strategic bidding is willing to accept the lower gross margin per unit in exchange for significantly higher volume and predictable revenue. OK, so when you're looking at doing strategic bidding, you want to set a sales target or a sales goal in writing so that you know exactly what you're going to do. You want to devote a functional person in your company to business development. And that can be a significant overhead expense, but you want that person to have clear expectations for the position. You want to create a job description, even if you're hiring from within or even if that's you, you want that to be clearly written out with a job description of what you want that person to do. You want to decide who that person reports to within the company and you want to make sure that they're accountable specifically to somebody. You want to assign responsibility in your organization for follow through. So whoever that person reports to, they want to make sure that those, that's accountable and that there's specific targets that they want. You want to implement tracking mechanisms so that you can measure, quantify, and gauge this function's effectiveness at periodic intervals. And then you want to develop a marketing strategy for your company, and you want that to align with what you want this person to do. So also in strategic bidding, you want to implement methods and benchmarks that are trackable as well as quantifiable so that you can gauge your effectiveness on weekly or monthly levels. Um, SAM.gov, any other government procurement portals, um, contacts made or appointments that are scheduled, the number of requests for estimates. You want to make sure that you use a quote log so that you can value, calculate your hit rate on how successful you are in your quotes. You also want to know your backlog. Um, that's going to be your signed contracts minus the contract value billed to date. That's going to be your backlog of work. And then you want to keep that pipe low, pipeline flowing and continually add new project potentials to the conveyor belt so that you've continuously got jobs coming up and you don't have big lulls in activity.
in summary, let's look at um, just some helpful strategic bidding tips. So in pricing before you submit your bid, think like the customer, not your estimator. So you want to look at it from their side of the project. Do a reality check and see what this project is worth. Growing businesses need people as much as they need cash. So you really want that devoted person to be able to do your business development. Think annual, not hourly. You want the big picture in this position. Higher volume long-term contracts with lower margin are going to support an increased infrastructure for your business. Long-term contracts can provide funding for added payroll, so you can leverage your employees' expertise to pursue other or new types of work, and it provides overhead dollars for facilities, computers, insurance that's going to support your increased business development functions. You want to add capacity to your business to bid more often and pursue bigger projects. That's how your company grows. And every contract builds a company's past performance. So whether you have a big profit margin or little profit margin, your past performance is going to build with that. So that is our summary of general con government contracting 101. We went over some basic terms, different types of estimates, looked at the process of actually crafting a detailed estimate, and then talked about some strategic bidding because it's not always about how much money you make, it's about these other potential incentives as well towards bidding on a project. So this has been the first of four video training series that we are going to do. The next one is actually gonna go into more on estimating um, and looking at how you actually refine those numbers, more so than we did in this one. So if you are interested, Keep an eye out next month. We'll be posting that onto the website as well. But thank you so much for participating in this. And if you have any questions or need want any more information, here's our phone numbers and emails. Feel free to reach out to us anytime. That's what we're here for. And we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks.